Hello and welcome to the video on angles and parallel lines. Before we get started here, let me quickly say that if you have not watched the previous video in the series, Parallel Lines and Transversals, I would highly suggest going back and watching that first. This video that we're currently going to watch here builds very heavily off of that previous video. Let's get started. The corresponding angle postulate says if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then each pair of corresponding angles are congruent. You'll notice it very specifically mentions you need to have two parallel lines. I know that lines Q and R here are parallel to each other because of this extra set of arrows. That extra set of arrows there told us that these lines are indeed parallel. So all my sets of corresponding angles would have to be congruent. This makes angles 1 and 5 congruent to each other as well as all the other sets of corresponding angles. Earlier we had learned things called vertical angles as well, and you'll notice since my vertical angles, angle 1 and angle 4 would have to be congruent. And angle 4 and 8 are a corresponding angle set that all four of these angles, angles 1, 4, 5, and 8, would have to be congruent to each other in this picture. The same could be said for the other set of angles. Since angles 2 and 6 are corresponding angles, they would have to be congruent to each other. And since angles 2 and 3 are congruent to each other because they're vertical angles, and 3 and 7 are corresponding angles, so angles 2 and 6 would have to be congruent, and angles 3 and 7 would have to be congruent because of the corresponding angles postulate. If we understand this postulate, we can use this to build off of and be able to understand the next three. Let's take a look at those. There's an alternate interior angles theorem. It says if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then each pair of alternate interior angles would have to be congruent. Well, if you stop and think about that, that should make sense here. If we use the corresponding angles postulates to say angles 1 and 5 have to be congruent, and we knew that angles 1 and 4 have to be congruent to each other because they're vertical angles, then using the transitive property here, angles 4 and 5 would also have to be congruent to each other. Also angles 3 and angle 6 would have to be congruent to each other because they're another set of alternate interior angles. The consecutive interior angles theorems should make sense as well if we think back to what we learned when we first talked about angles. This says that if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then each pair of consecutive interior angles is going to have to be supplementary. If you remember, supplementary meant that they add up to 180 degrees. Well, this theorem is true because if I have two corresponding angles, like before, angles 1 and angle 5, I know they have to be congruent because of the corresponding angles postulate. I also know that angles 1 and 3 form a linear pair. So angles 1 and 3 have to add up to 180 degrees. So using a little substitution here, if I take angle 1 and replace it, with angle 5, because angle 5 is equal to angle 1, I can say that angle 5 plus angle 3 has to add up to 180 degrees. This is why consecutive interior angles here need to add up to 180. This would work for both sets of consecutive interior angles. So not only does angles 3 and 5 have to be supplementary, but angles 4 and 6 would have to be as well. And the third of these theorems, the alternate exterior angle theorem, says if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then each pair of alternate exterior angles has to be congruent to each other. The logic here is very similar as well. Using the corresponding angles postulate, I again know angles 1 and 5 have to be congruent. If angles 1 and 5 are congruent, and angles 5 and 8 are congruent because they're vertical angles, again using a little substitution, angle 1 and 8 have to be congruent to each other as well. This also works for the other set of angles, so angles 2 and 7 would also be congruent. The perpendicular transversal theorem says that in a plane, if a line is perpendicular to one of two parallel lines, then it's got to be perpendicular to the other. All this is saying is if I have two lines, we'll call them line L and line M, if those are parallel to each other, and I have a third line, in this case I'm going to call it line N, if that line N is perpendicular to the first of these two parallel lines, then it has to be perpendicular to the other. The reason why, again, is the corresponding angles postulate. If this is a 90 degree angle, well, these two angles there would have to be congruent to each other. If one of them is 90, the other one would have to be as well, meaning N is perpendicular to both L and M. So in this example, if L and M were parallel to each other and N and L are perpendicular, I know N and M need to be perpendicular as well. All right, so let's try a few examples here. 
Let's start with a fairly simple picture. Again, you'll notice in order to use these theorems, you have to have those parallel lines. And in this particular picture, we are given right away that these two lines are parallel to each other. We're told that angle 5 is 51 degrees. We want to find the measure of angle 1. Well, if angle 5 is 51 degrees, angles 1 and 5 are corresponding angles, so angle 1 has to be 51 degrees as well. Part B, if angle 5 is 57 degrees, find the measure of angle 4. Well, angle 5 and angle 4 are alternate interior angles, and alternate interior angles also need to be congruent to each other using the alternate interior angles theorem. That makes angle 4 also 57 degrees. Part C, if angle 5 is 62 degrees, find the measure of angle 3. Well, if angle 5 is 62 degrees, I know angles 3 and 5 are consecutive interior angles. Those angle sets have to be supplementary. So I would take the 180 degrees I know they have to add up to and subtract angle 5 to get that my remaining angle here is 118. And the last set of angles here, if the measure of angle 2 is 123, What's the measure of angle 7? Well, the measure of angle 7 down here would also be 123 degrees because these are alternate exterior angles. And alternate exterior angles have to be congruent if my two lines, Q and R, are parallel to each other. Let's move on to a slightly more complicated picture. In this picture, I again are given that lines P and Q are parallel to each other. If that's the case, I'm going to again have some angle sets that are either congruent or supplementary. I'm told that angle 5 is 58 degrees, and the measure of angle 4 is 67 degrees. Now at first glance here you might say, how can that be? Those are consecutive interior angles. Don't they have to be supplementary? Well, they would have to be supplementary if these two lines were parallel to each other. But we're not told that those are parallel to each other, so angles 4 and 5 here don't have to be supplementary. Let's start along the first line here where angle 5 is 58 degrees. I know that angles 5 and 7 are alternate interior angles. Since P and Q are parallel, those would have to be congruent. So angle 7 is 58 degrees. Angles 5 and 9 are corresponding angles, so they would also have to be congruent to each other, meaning angle 9 is 58 degrees. And angles 5 and 2 here are a linear pair. We learned previously that those have to be supplementary. So if angle 5 is 58, if I do 180 minus the 58, I'm going to get the 122 degrees for the measure of angle 2. We can now do some similar logic along the other line. If I work along this line, I know the measure of angle 4 is 67 degrees. If the measure of angle 4 is 67, I know the measure of angle 6 is also 67 because they're alternate interior angles. Angles 4 and 8 are corresponding angles, so angle 8 in here would also be 67 degrees. And angle 1 would have to be 67 because angles 8 and 1 are alternate exterior angles. Angles 6 and 3 would have to be consecutive interior angles of those two parallel lines, so they'd have to be supplementary. So 180 minus the 67, well, that would give me 113 degrees for angle 3. There's only one angle left we have to figure out here, and that's the measure of angle 10. If I'm told that angle 9 is 58 degrees, and I'm told that the measure of angle 8 is 67 degrees, the third angle in any triangle has to add up to 180 with the other two. If I add up the 58 and the 67, I get 125 degrees. So when I subtract that from 180, I get that, that my third angle here has to be 55 degrees. That means the measure of angle 10 over here is 55 degrees. And let's try one more problem. In this case, I have two sets of parallel lines. Line A and B are parallel to each other as are lines C and D. I'm told that the measure of angle 5 is 2x minus 10. The measure of angle 11 is 4 times the quantity y minus 25. And the measure of angle 13 is x plus 15. Our goal here is to figure out what x and y are. Let's start with angles 5 and 13. Those two angles are corresponding angles. We knew from the corresponding angle postulate that corresponding angles of parallel lines have to be congruent to each other. If they're equal to each other, I can then just solve for x. I do that by subtracting x from both sides, then solving for x by adding 10. So my first answer here, x has to be 25. I can quickly double check that by plugging it back in. Back into angle 5, two 25s would be 50 minus 10 is 40 degrees for angle 5. If we did this right, the other one here should turn out to be the same size. 25 plus 15 
is 40 as well, so we know we got it right. Now let's solve for y. To solve for y, I need to write another equation. This time, I can look at angles 11 and 13 and say that those are consecutive interior angles. My consecutive interior angles have to be supplementary if the lines are parallel. So my 4 times the quantity y minus 25 plus the 40 degrees that I know angle 13 is now have to add up to 180. Now it's a matter of solving for y. I do that by distributing. After I distribute, I get 4y minus 100 plus the 40 equals 180. When I combine my like terms, I get 4y minus 60 equals 180. I then need to add the 60 to both sides. To get 4y has to equal 240 degrees. And then to solve for y, I divide by 4 on both sides to get y is 60. Again, I can quickly double check my work here by plugging it back in. If y is 60, 4 times the quantity 60 minus 25 is 4 times 35 or 140 degrees. Angle 11 would then be 140 degrees. Angle 13 would be 40 degrees. So they do indeed add up to 180. We know I got our problem right.